an awful lot came out after the war and that has sort of bezoodled my mind a bit. I remember I rang the front door of the house of the Zegbokran and Kokkoi came and she said in Malay, Gonda is back. I looked at her. I froze in my shoes and I said, where is she? And she said, she is in the kitchen. So I rushed to the kitchen and there was Gonda and I couldn't believe it. I froze. I froze. There she was alive. I knew that she would get through because she was so extraordinarily beautiful and so distinguished, that whole posture, everything, that I don't think any other human being, last of all, a man, could kill her. And I said, Ghanda, did you really get into a concentration? Oh, yes, she said. And then she lifted up her skirt and showed the mark, the uh, 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 brandished brandishment, and her arm. She had two marks. I don't know why, but she had two marks brandished on her. I never asked her how she escaped. I think she didn't escape. I think they just let her free because the Allies were coming. They walked out of the camp and just started walking towards Holland. That is the way Gonda came. To this English lessons I had from this woman, Miss Moore. She asked about people uh, uh, hiding, and so I said, yes, people hiding with the farmers, if they can, I said, uh, but uh, it isn't easy. She knew a girl in The Hague who very much was looking for a hiding place. Her father is the head rabbi of the Warsaw Synagogue. I told her about Defender, that's where we lived. And she said her fiancé of this Honda was actually the assistant rabbi of the synagogue in Defender. Did I know of some farmer where she could live and help with the household or something like that? Well, I said, uh, the great thing to do is first to go to that part of the country and then look from there on because I just didn't know offhand of anybody. I said, uh, but in, if she goes to my mother's place, then maybe she can from there on scout for herself. I uh, wrote my mother a letter about this girl. My mother was living way in the countryside. She joined my mother there, and when my mother went from the country to Devonter, she went with the family. She was young and she was beautiful. She was the nicest person you can have live with you and hide with you. My sister said too, she was the loveliest of all the people that we hid. She was beautiful and she had uh, the big almond eyes, a flawless skin, a little aquiline nose, and she had a poise that was obviously a very upper class and, uh, and, and a beautiful smile. She had dark hair, uh, uh, blackish, and so she dyed it blonde with paraxid, so did Clara. Uh, there was another Jewish girl who lived with us. <laughs> Everybody was horrified she paraxied her hair, because when finally the paraxid sto stopped working, she wasn't blonde at all. She was bright red, flaming red hair. There's no way she could walk between Dutch women. She looked ten times more gorgeous with that head of hair. Honda would sneak out at night to visit the fiancé under the synagogue. 
And it's very frustrating to live with people if you're not of the same religion and the same um, ethnic group. And you get something particularly during the winter, it's called igloo fever. One day she told my mother she wanted to live with her fiancé under the synagogue. My mother uh, was very worried because she knew, my mother, that Honda would be uh, someday be caught. She didn't feel at home at our house with the other Jews. You would think she would have something in common with them, but she didn't. She came from a much better class than the other Jews. To start with, they were Dutch Jews. They were not Polish Jews. She didn't speak her language with these Jews. I asked my mother later, why did she come back? Uh, she said, I guess to show me that she was alive. She asked if the Germans had come to the house. And I said, yes. And then she asked, did they find anybody? And my mother said, no. Everybody hid. Uh, my mother, I think, asked her, why do you ask that question? And she said, well, I just was tortured. She said, I was tortured. And I had to tell, thank God she had the intelligence never to tell the box wall that she was hi hidden there. She told the German police there, wherever she was tortured in Poland or Germany, that she hid in the country, those places in the country. So they went to those homes, the Germans, and did the razzias in those homes, but they never found anybody. She hoped that my mother would tell where all these people hid, and my mother didn't. My mother was so furious that she left and left us all exposed to the ravages of war and so she never told Honda. Honda left the house to be with her fiancé. That's when my mother told everybody, now the Germans will come so we have to do something. We have to get organized. Everybody here in this house has to think of ideas how we hide from the Germans. And so we had the meeting together and said, we have to fool the Germans because we're going to have an ambush, you know, a razzia. And so everybody put their two cents in. Jan van Elsens couldn't live without that shortwave, how the war was going. So he got the hammer and everywhere in the house he did that between floors, against walls, anything that he could put a shortwave. So then he went to the attic. He went to this place that he thought there might be, what they call a dead space. And he went everywhere there with the hammer. Everybody heard him hammering. Then suddenly there was a spot that was sounded hollow and he threw off the rug and then the linoleum got a saw and just simply made a hole and sawed a square out of the floor, wood, and then he lived and saved the wood to make like a trap door. So he found uh, uh, this enormous room, it was 12 by, by 8 feet, I think. It was really like a whole room. And the people, if they went in there, they could even stand in it. What they did, they threw some mattresses in there, very thin ones, uh, from the beds, so that they could go down soft, you know, in case they were running all over the house. And uh, so I know they threw some mattresses in there, so also that it wouldn't be so cold uh, there, because there was no heat in there, of course. And then they had drills. The point of the drill was that how could those people hit in there, you know, in the shortest time, while she and 
uh, the Babu and other and my brothers were uh, finding all kind and uh, thinking up all kind of gimmicks how to hold uh, back the Germans. My mother didn't know German, so they shout to her in German, all things open the door, and so and my mother acts if she doesn't understand. And then somebody else's head was coming out. That was of Koki, our Indonesian cook. Now the last thing they expected was to see an Indonesian face. So they were taken aback. Well, you'll be surprised how that uh, gains a few minutes. They were a bit conster, uh, what you call consternation, you know. And so shout more. Ah, Koki, of course, talks to them in Malay. They don't understand Malay. Saya tis saya tisa bi menerti. I don't understand you in Malay. Well, of course, this confuses them much more. So then finally the cocky goes downstairs and opens the door for them. So they rush in in the vestibule where you put hang your coat and umbrellas and so where the Germ uh, the Germans and the Dutch Christian blues always see in every Dutch vestibule the Queen of Holland, Queen Wilhelmina, there wasn't, there was Hitler. Uh, I think a very big portrait of Hitler. You have no idea. This is completely confuses them. And, and for a moment they seem to think, uh, maybe we are at the wrong house. So, but then, this is, was amazing to us. They click their heels, but the Dutch never do, Dutch soldiers. They click their heels. They have these big boots on. They click their heels. And Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, and all this Heil Hitler, their Führer, you know, their God. And they were so, uh, and we were amazed to look, and my mother said, I wasn't there when this happened. My mother said how they were um, paralyzed. They were absolutely paralyzed to see this enormous picture of Hitler. And so, but they were much nicer, they changed. They were much more, well, what could you say, accommodating. So my mother said, come in, come in, be, sit. And my mother let them into the front room, the parlor, and, and, then, and then she offered them a glass of schnapps while all this went on, of, uh, sort of slowing them down. Some matrices had been, had to be thrown in that hole too, on top of the ones that were already there, because if the Germans had the intelligence or the Dutch Landwacht police to feel in the beds, then they feel that the beds were warm. Where are the people? They are somewhere. They would have burned the house down, I think, to get at them. The Germans just went up and then when you know, then they left and so. So they never found any, anybody in that house.